So my name is Charles Duan. I am an adjunct professor at American University Washington College of Law. Um, this is a panel that is being hosted by the Program for Information Justice and Intellectual Property. I hope I got all of those words right. Um, we've been hosting these panels on um, the Supreme Court and intellectual property cases for uh, many years. This was actually one of the first events that I attended uh, back in 20. This is one of the first type of events I attended in DC when I moved here back in 2012. So I'm excited to now be hosting something that was, I guess, sort of formative to my to my policy career. Um, I'm delighted to see that Mike Carroll is um, is going to be hopefully joining us. Uh, Mike is, of course, a fantastic professor of copyright law here, um, and you know, I'm looking forward to having a great discussion with everybody. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so I'm delighted to be here um, talking with all of you about the Amgen versus Sanofi case, which was argued in the Supreme Court this morning. This is a case that I would describe as what seems like a small technical legal issue, except one that has tremendous implications for biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, and also other industries based on the briefs that we saw in the software industry and other areas. The case, is, the case deals with 35 USC section 112a, a requirement of um, obtaining a patent, which says that the text of a patent has to describe an invention sufficiently for a person of skill in the art to make and use the invention. This might seem like a ministerial task, except when you ask, as Justice Thomas asked at the very beginning of the oral argument, what an invention actually is. The invention is defined by a part of the patent called the claims and can cover just a few things or can cover many things, particularly for an area like monoclonal antibodies as was um, at issue in, the, in this case. You can have similar looking products that work very differently when actually put to use and vice versa. And the question is what exactly has to be written in the patent text under section 112A to entitle a patent holder to a so-called genus or a class of related products covered by the patent. I'm delighted to be joined today by Emily Johnson. Um, Emily Johnson is with Amgen, the petitioner in the case um, by we also have Michael Penn, who is the Vice President of Intellectual Property for Instill Bio. Instill Bio filed an amicus brief in support of Amgen in this case. Um, we have Professor Josh Sarnoff, who is at the DePaul University College of Law, who filed a brief on behalf of law professors um, in support of the respondent. We have Professor Nina Strejovic from Georgetown Law School, who filed a brief on behalf of the Public Interest Patent Law Institute. And last but not least, we have Melanie Bostwick, um, who is an attorney with Aura Carrington and Sutcliffe, who filed a brief on behalf of a number of pharmaceutical companies, Genentech, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Gilead, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, so thank you all for, for participating in this panel. I think this is going to be a really great discussion. Um, Emily, I'd like to start with you as, um, as a member of the Petitioner's Council team. Um, the rule in this case that is at issue, the Federal Circuit said that it's necessary to satisfy, in order to satisfy Section 112, one has to enable the full scope of the claims. What do you see for Amgen as kind of at stake with that rule, and why do you think that it's necessary for, um, for you to challenge it? What do you see as kind of the, the, the thing that really matters in this case for you? Uh, thanks, Charles. L let me first by start by saying it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for having me today. Um, th this case goes to the heart of what is required to prove enablement. And um, Amgen has long believed that um, a, a patent must enable the full scope of the claimed invention. Um, here, the Federal Circuit applied a heightened standard, um, which asked um, how much cumulative time and effort is required to reach to to reach the full scope of the claimed invention? Um, in in our view, that that goes beyond the statutory requirement and the standard that the Supreme Court has used for uh, for centuries, which um, uh, applies a more reasonable test, which which is what does the patent teach to a person skilled in the art, what would the uh, how would a, a an antibody scientist in this case um, uh, interpret the teachings of the patent, and could they reach 
all categories of the, the invention that's claimed. We, we believe that the law in terms of enablement has always placed the burden on the defendant to come forward to prove evidence that there is a um, there are there is an inoperable embodiment or there's some some unworkable um, element of the invention to prove that a patent is not enabled and and in this case um, that that evidence um, is not present. Um, we we went through two jury trials and um, the defendants had the opportunity to come forward with evidence to show that there was some type of antibody that couldn't be made using the patent's teachings. And um, ultimately the jury found an Amgen's favor both times. So um, what, what we've asked the Supreme Court to do is to return to the, the statutory requirement that um, a patent um, enable a skilled artisan to make and use the full scope of, of the invention. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't able to get counsel for Sanofi to, um, to, to attend this panel, but um, I am delighted to have uh, Mel Boswick who represented a number of pharmaceutical companies here. And I do find, you know, an interesting thing about this case is that you have pharmaceutical companies kind of on both sides of it. And so Mel, I wonder if you can kind of talk about what the perspective of your clients and of your brief um, were in this case. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, like Emily, I'll say, um, Thank you very much for, for having me on the panel. Um, uh, it's fun to be here. This is, is a really interesting and important case, obviously, uh, uh, to everyone on, on both sides of the issue or all sides of the issue, I should say. Um, and I will also caution that um, anything I'm saying here is not on behalf of my clients. Uh, it is on behalf of, of my, myself and, and my opinions. But you know, our, our brief, um, our amicus brief had kind of two related components, one doctrinal, but one one policy related and um, our, our position is that um, there hasn't been a change in the standard that the federal circuits enablement test um, is uh, exactly what the enablement statute has required since you know the founding of, of the country um, and and that it is um, requiring patentees to enable the full scope of their invention of course the claims define the invention and if you claim a genus, and particularly if you claim a genus of materials by what it does rather than what it is, then that's necessarily going to require more uh, disclosure to actually enable what you are claiming a, a monopoly over. Um, and and on the policy point, you know, the the clients I represented here are are all you know biopharmaceutical companies and and what are all biopharmaceutical companies ultimately trying to do is serve patients, right? And so we tried to lay out why we think that the, the law as is, is best serving patients in particular um, by, you know, preventing one company that has kind of an initial piece of, uh, of, of a discovery in particularly in a new area or an unpredictable area like antibody science, um, prevent them from, from kind of monopolizing the whole field and therefore discouraging others from coming along later, finding um, things that would be within the genus, but that the original, that the patentee didn't actually discover or invent, um, and and offering patients, um, you know, particularly patients facing like really tough to treat diseases, um, uh, you know, multiple options to try to find the best therapy. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, one of the things that came up quite often during the arguments um, was a discussion of incentives for innovation and what this would mean for the development of new treatments. And that's obviously going to be very important with regard to early stage companies. And so Mike, you work for an early stage company. I think you filed a brief kind of from that perspective. Uh, can you give us kind of the elevator pitch for your company and why you found it um, important to, to file and to, to um, put, put in some thoughts into the record on this case? Oh, great question, Charles. And again, thank you uh, for having me. And thanks to all the panelists who are joining here. It's such an important case for the, the industry. Instill Bio is a cell and gene therapy company. Um, we actually develop gene modified um, T cell products to treat cancer. It's similar to a CAR T type of approach, but using a, a different cell platform. The CAR-T approach necessarily needs antibody type technology. So that's, that's our interest in it. 
really what we wanted to focus on with our filing was what happens in the real world with small companies. It's great to see companies like Amgen fighting this fight, um, fighting to keep the patent system to do what it's meant to do, incentivize innovation. Um, Amgen benefited from it when they were a small startup. It's, it's interesting seeing the opposing side have parties like Genentech and AstraZeneca and others who also benefited from it when they were small companies. And now they seemingly don't want to benefit from it. So it's almost like they've reached these heights and now they want to pull the ladder up to keep small upstarts like Instill Bio from reaching those same heights. We need these patents. This is, this is the tool um, that we have to fight the big players ultimately to get more drugs to patients. And when we don't have those broad claims that really are commensurate in scope with what we've, we've brought to the table, what Amgen, what others have brought to the table, you, you see very rapidly in real time investment drought. We see it happen, other startups see it happen. I was, I was surprised that there's a, an amici filing from a group of small startups it, it's surprising to me because the capital markets are dismal right now for biotech. They're, they're the worst they've likely ever been for the industry. And when they see patents getting squeezed and, and patent breadth getting squeezed year over year, that investment goes elsewhere. So are we going to see it immediately? Probably not. Are we going to see five, 10 years out, 15 years out when we start seeing these really cutting edge therapies disappear or not be there we won't know what we will have that's the fear that, fantastic thanks for that perspective um nina uh, let me let me ask you about the the discussion of the quid pro quo which came up quite often um the supreme court talked many times about this idea that patents are meant to be a quid pro quo and disclosure is what the patent um, what, what the patent applicant gives. And so you represent an organization that um, kind of looks at the public interest um, concerns with regard to patents. And so what sort of things did you focus on when you were preparing that brief? What sorts of things do you think are important in terms of the public interest for this case? Yeah, um, thanks, Charles. I just want to echo everyone else and thank you for um, asking me to be here today. Um, as you mentioned, um, I and students at the at Georgetown's Intellectual Property and Information Policy Clinic filed a amicus brief on behalf of the Public Interest Patent Law Institute, um, and the Public Interest Patent Institute, Public Interest Patent Law Institute, I guess, was one of the friends that Justice Gorsuch referred to today when he said he had so many friends in this case that he could hardly stand it. But we were one of those friends, um, and we really focused on. Uh, we did focus a lot on this question of quid pro quo patent system. And we really view this notion as um, balancing the innovative incentives that the patent system is, is structured to um, provide with the cost that the patent system inevitably has to, um, in this case, we focused a lot on the cost to consumers and to patients. Um, so you have to balance the exclusive rights that a patent gives, um, the scope of that invention with the um, cost to patients and people that pay for the monopoly that pat the patent system gives. Um, so we, we kind of, talked all the way from, um, as, as uh, Melanie Bostic mentioned, the, the founding of, of our country, even back in those days, um, the founders were concerned with how the patent system can actually be costly. Not that it shouldn't exist, but, but the costs have to be considered as well. Um, we, we talked about the, um, back in, when the Wright brothers invented the airplane and, and how that example of even though they did invent something nobody can deny that was quite innovative, it ended up also having a cost, a cost that was so great that the government had to come in and um, come up with some kind of patent pool so that innovation could continue in the, in the wartime era. Um, and with regard to the current invention, um, there's, there's a cost to broad, the broad claims. I think this is a perfect example. If we, I think the, Patients and consumers are better off when there are multiple um, 
treatments on the market. And um, if there's a broad claim that can either increase the cost to um, these different treatments on the market, or it can um, really avoid there being multiple options on the market in the first place. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and you know, you mentioned that there was some discussion of a lot of amicus briefs in this case, and you know, I think that the the law professors' amicus briefs um, got quite a bit of airtime. And so, Josh, um, you know, you you obviously filed one of those one of those law professor briefs, which seemed to have a substantial impact on the court. Uh, can you tell me kind of what you were hoping to do with your brief, and more generally, what you see as the role of the amicus briefs um, from law professors and from others playing in this case, as you heard from the oral argument? Sure. Um, first, my thanks as well for being here. Second, nothing I'm about to say should be attributed to my client. That was a joke. <laughs> um, and um, let me start with just to add to one point about the innovation balance. Um, Sanofi's uh, advocate, Paul Clement, focused on the idea that you know, multiple forms of treatment are, are better um, and therefore giving a broad blocking patent is not a good thing. Um, in contrast, the US government focused on the disincentive for sequential innovation to identify structure function relationships. That uh, was the key to the concern about diminishing sequential innovation. Um, my brief uh, to start there was really focused on the structure function relationship and the nature of invention itself. What does it mean to be an invention? So I tried to give a history that got the court to understand that under multiple doctrines, because the court didn't address written description in this case, it didn't address except peripherally the section 112F functional claiming doctrine, it didn't address uh, distinct claiming for single functional claim, uh, non-combination claims. And all of these went back to one basic principle is you can't claim a result or a function. You have to claim a relationship between structure and function that's disclosed. And that's what we argued uh, was lacking here, making it a really easy case for enablement. The second thing was to try to get the court to provide more guidance. So going back again, um, the, it, it, I th the court got everyone to agree that the cumulative test isn't right, that it's not a, just a matter of how much cumulative effort to uh, make the entire scope of the gene, oh, sorry, the claim. And if that's right, then the question is, is why isn't this just a fact-bound case? And you know, there was actually a suggestion that they dismiss it as improvidently granted and let the district, let it go back or um, just you know, let it sit because it was just a fact-bound case. Instead, you really have a very different concept between the petitioner's view and the respondent's view. The petitioner's view is, if you can make one thing within the claim without too much effort, and if you, therefore, um, the person of skill in the art only cares really about being able to make one thing, that's enough for enablement. And then the burden is on the challenger to demonstrate that there's something in the genus that actually not only doesn't work or takes way too much effort to make, but also that the person of ordinary skill cares about and therefore would want to make. Um, in contrast, it wasn't clear exactly what standard the um, respondents were articulating, but they seem to suggest that they're, you know, you have to make be able to demonstrate initially that there isn't anything that's going to fall within the claim that would be undue to make. That's a, obviously a very different standard, very different burdens. Um, the applicant has the burden at the, um, in theory, of actually demonstrating in their specification sufficient information. Uh, and then the patent office is supposed to, in theory, respond to that. But it's a very different standard. So we don't know where that goes. Um, my basic thought was to try to get the court to at least focus on the structure function relationship and the nature of invention. 
and say, what is a genus invention in the first place? And that would have helped the court because when they got to the end and they finally got to structure and function and the kind of experimentation, the case law history says the difference is between mechanical skill and, invent and inventive skill. That's the kind of experimentation that shouldn't be allowed. So what you had, at least in our, our my argument was, this is just not enabling the invention. It's enabling people to invent the, in, the claims or what um, bodies within the claims. So then the court really was very concerned, apparently, with our colleague Mark Lemley's brief um, based on our now deceased colleague, Dimitri Karstadt. Uh, it's interesting they didn't refer to him, um, but Dimitri uh, with Mark Lemley and Sean Seymour published an article called The Death of the Genus Claim, claiming that the Federal Circuit has increasingly ratcheted up the pressure. It's not clear that the court is convinced that that was the case. There were a whole bunch of questions asking, has the Federal Circuit actually changed the standard? Um, but the basic thought was, and again, this is the point that Amgen started with, is that if this is in fact more restrictive than what it had been, that's bad for innovation. And given the way it was articulated in um, the, you know, in the federal circuit in this case, that precedent is likely to be followed in a bad way. I'm not convinced that the court accepts that, but I did, I did do think that they've convinced the court not to get rid of the case, but to actually either affirm the federal circuit and clarify what it means or do something else. And I'll stop there. The one last thing. Um, since you asked me to talk about the other briefs, there was a lot of discussion of the winter brief by the scientists, uh, Nobel Prize winner on Amgen, so, I'm sorry, on Sanafi's side, um, talking about the unpredictability and the lack of a structural functional relationship uh, when making antibodies and therefore the need to specify antibodies by genetic sequence structure rather, or, or protein sequence structure rather than simply by function. Um, I don't know what the court really thought about that, but that was clearly an important thing that they seem to be trying to get at. And I'll stop there. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thanks for um, th thanks for reminding me about or for, for bringing up Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri was a good friend of mine, and um, who, who, as you mentioned, tragically passed away recently. And so we're we're still mourning his loss um, in this case and in other contexts. Um, you mentioned at the end the winner brief, and you know I think that that segues nicely into what I was hoping to talk about, which is um, let's get into the argument and what's going on. Um, I don't know why I'm spotlighted now. Um, anyway, what um, this is a hard case. This is a case that involves a lot of difficult science. Um, that where you heard words like epitopes being tossed around by by counsel. Um, in these sorts of cases, which are very common for for patent cases because patents involve technology. Um, we often find counsel having to um, having to use things like analogies, um, trying to refer to historical examples, trying to come up with hypotheticals that are easier to understand. Um, I'd love it if you could talk about the ones that you've heard during this argument that really stuck out as potentially persuasive or potentially interesting um, to the courts or to to yourselves. Um, if any of you have a favorite, I think it would be great um, to to tell our audience about the about what happened in this argument. I'll, I'll just mention very briefly that Justice Thomas um, specifically mentioned the combination lock example, which uh, our colleague Oscar Livek had written in his brief. Unfortunately, they didn't mention Oscar by name, uh, which is always what you want to hear. But nevertheless, that seemed to be uh, on their minds. I thought, you know, personally, I thought that the um, the paint mixing example that that Paul Clement brought up was uh, useful because it gave people something easier to think about than uh, that than um, the sort of the complicated technology that you hear, which is always what you want. But then, you know, to me, what what stood out was that none of the justices really seemed to pick it, other than mention the mention of the the combination lock. That you know, you didn't have uh, the kind of argument where some somebody picks up on one hypo and then it carries throughout the argument. Um, I, I was surprised um, by, uh, you know, the fact that the justices 
they had a lot of questions about what what's the invention, but they didn't have a lot of confusion. I thought about the science. I think they were they they were trying to get at what do these claims actually cover and and what you know what does the specification actually actually disclose and how do we uh, match those against each other? But not so much sort of the they, they anytime one of the the advocates tried to get into like explaining the science, I felt like the reaction was yeah yeah no I get that but. Um, so, so that was interesting to me. I, I agree. I agree. It was interesting to contrast like this argument with the argument in the Oracle Google case where that was all the justices did. The whole, <laughs> the whole argument was try to come up with an analogy that they could understand the technology by. And in this, this case, it didn't seem to be such a big problem. I don't think any of the analogies jumped out to me because it is a very difficult subject to analogize. What did jump out, I actually think the justices may not have fully understood where the science is these days for antibody technology. How so? 20 years ago, you could screen. So the, the government argued and actually brought up phage display. So while we're talking about phage display, 20 years ago, you could screen billions of different clones in days. That was 20 years ago. Today, you have phage display libraries of trillions of clones. You can screen these, and this is automated. Now, it's not a computer, and that was a bit confusing when they went down that path, but it's automated screening of these phage antibodies. You can screen trillions in likely less than a day. That is yes. routine. That is what every antibody scientist deals with these days. It is incredibly routine. Once you're told what target to go after, or in the case of Amgen, which you have these two anchor antibodies that help you set up a high throughput screen, you can immediately screen a trillion clones and then go to these two anchors and immediately screen out whatever hits you get from those trillions. It, it really was a little unsettling watching some of the arguments and I have, I have other people who understand the technology who, who have said the same thing. Uh, let me just follow that up. No, go ahead, Emily. Uh, thanks, Josh. I, I, I was just going to, to echo uh, Mike's comments there that um, I, I do think this is very complex technology and um, it's easy to get lost in if you don't live in the world every day. Um, I, I thought Justice Sotomayor had a good line of questioning probing on where the undue experimentation would be to, to you know, reach the other antibodies within the genus. And you know, she rightfully asked um, Paul Clement to articulate the steps and, and which step would require um, undo experimentation versus routine experimentation. And in our view that this is um, screening antibodies after, after a mice is immunized and you, and you get you know, your batch, um, screening them for, to find the ones that have the, the right biological effect is, is something that, as Mike said, is, has been done for several dec decades at this point. And, and it is automated using a high throughput processes and um, so it, it's, you know, for antibody scientists, it's something that they're, they're doing on a, a regular basis at, at very low cost. Um, so um, there, there does seem to be a, a huge, um, a huge um, factual disagreement um, on, on that issue. Um, and, you know, we, uh, the, those different views were presented um, to, to the jury um, and ultimately they, um, you know, found in Amgen's favor on that point. Um, I, I would like to just quickly address kind of the, the policy considerations here about the concerns that, that Amgen is, is overclaiming in this space. Um, you know, in, in our view, um, we made a breakthrough invention here. It was not known that you could dramatically lower cholesterol using engineered antibodies. That's something that our scientists worked on developing over a decade. Um, that um, you know, there there have been 
um, folks who have been concerned that our patents have blocked the ability of others to innovate in that space. And that's just really not what we've seen happen in the real world. Um, we've seen our competitors like Merck and Pfizer and, uh, and Novartis um, discover other PCSK9 antibodies that bind to di different locations of the antigen. Um, we've seen other competitors develop um, different ways of interfering with the protein um, siRNA, which, um, which um, actually prevents the production of the protein in the body, which is a, a very cool, unique way of solving kind of the same problem. We've also seen companies develop small molecule inhibitors. So we are seeing um, significant leaps forward in terms of treating cholesterol. Um, and so, so these genus claims, in, in our view, encourage others in the field um, to read our patents, learn about what Amgen discovered, and then seek another way to, to solve the same problem. And that promotes discovery of not just copycats or Me Too antibodies, but real unique um, solutions that, that may benefit patients in a different way and, and push the science forward. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I should mention that if anybody from the audience wants to ask a question, um, please feel free to put it into the chat or the Q&A. But uh, Josh, go ahead. Yeah. So on the same points, I think that the strongest part of Jeff Lampkin's argument was his discussion of how you guys filter down to find the antibodies. But that raises the fundamental question, which is again why I filed my brief, is that invention? Or is it just enabling other people to invent by filtering themselves? That's the core question here. And again, the enablement doctrine may not have been the best choice of doctrines to bring this up under, but at least the argument is, is you can't enable what you haven't invented. You can enable people to invent what you haven't invented. And unfortunately, the court didn't get a clear statement about that issue and is going to have difficulty trying to sort it out without having some sense of what it is that has to constitute an invention. Because again, it may be that it's enabled in the sense that you've enabled people without a lot of effort to make new things. The question is, is that are they making the invention when they actually up front, ex ante, don't really have an idea of what the things are? All right, uh, we have a question from the audience and I'll just read this out. Uh, while patent law is supposed to be technology neutral, is there something unique about the enablement question for antibody claims in particular? That is, it's not just a matter of trial and error, but the fact that the person of skill in the art would be at nature's mercy to, as to whether an immunized mouse can produce a claimed antibody. Um, and the questioner says that he doesn't know of any other type of technology where um, nature is so important to the um, to the person of skill in the art. Um, does anybody want to talk a little bit about that? I think it is a really interesting question. The court did ask um, at various points whether antibody technology is special in some way. Yeah, I mean, I can oh, go go ahead. Ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, bro. I, I um, you know, I'll I'll leave the the scientific aspects of it to the much more qualified uh, folks on this panel. But, you know, from, from a legal point of view, one of the things we touched on in our brief is that the um, test that uh, Amgen and its amici were proposing or a lot of the arguments sort of asked for a form of antibody exceptionalism. Um, in other words, that look, antibodies are, are different, like this is, and, and so, you know, in this area, um, essentially a, a lax, what we view as a laxer enablement standard should apply. And we, you know, are, I don't think that's, that's the, the way to go. I think that we need one standard that's applicable in all areas of technology. So there was a discussion of the Myriad case and how this is a way around myriad by claiming anything that blocks the natural function. Um, again, I don't think that was particularly edifying to the court or helpful. Um, what I think would have been helpful, and particularly in regard to um, the comment by, it was by Chris Paul Rash, who's a PTAB judge, um, 
is what does it mean to invent when you know you're dealing with something that has highly unpredictable structural function relationships if somebody else can make one thing within the claim is that enough to say that you've invented uh, all things within the claim that actually work what's most interesting about this claim is that almost by definition you're never going to have any false negatives because the claim requires that it function in the way that it's been drafted so no one's asking how many structures might you have to test to figure out whether any particular one works because as the argument went no one cares about whether any particular one works all they care about is whether something works that may or may not be enablement but it certainly doesn't sound like invention of a genus so i i don't think we really have a myriad problem here because amgen developed um therapeutic antibodies that um are are engineered they don't exist in um, and they're, they're treating people with really serious high cholesterol um, and lowering their, their risk of heart attack and stroke. Um, I, I do think um, antibody uh, science and, and other biological inventions are, are somewhat unique because of the way that we go about discovering these molecules. We're, we're harnessing the power of genetically engineered mice, their, their, their immune systems, we actually place a human immune system inside a mouse, which is wild that that's possible, and then rely on the, 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 that immune system to, to produce um, the antibodies. And those, so the, the immune system does all of the work to find all of the, the potential candidates that would bind to the right location on um, whatever you know antigen you're seeking to inhibit. Um, so that and then you know we then use routine screening procedures to find really the best ones, the best the ones that bind and block um, with with the right affinity and have other characteristics that are are useful for developing into a, a therapeutic molecule. Um, I do think there is there is both structural structural and chemical similarity amongst those antibodies that um, are made by the mouse and then screened and selected um, because they they have to they have to bind um, in a very small region um, to the protein that has nooks and crannies and um, electrochemical properties. So, all of the claimed antibodies are going to, to be able to fit in that unique location. Now, they are going to have slightly different shapes and, slit and different amino acid sequences, um, but, but there, are, you know, there are overarching structural and chemical similarities amongst the genus, which is, which is why they are claimed as they are in our patents. I, I think that whether... Um... And, and this is something that's not in our brief, so this is just me, not my client. Um, I think that whether um, Amgen has a one-on-one -on -one problem with whether they get too close to claiming something that occurs in nature really depends on how the claim claim is drafted. If if the claim is drafted to this, you know, antibody that they have created, then yeah, there's no problem. But I think that once the claim starts being framed in a purely functional manner, that you can kind of get closer to a one-on-one -on -one issue. It's um, it's kind of as Justice Thomas recounted, instead of claiming the steam engine, you're claiming the power of steam. Um, so I think it all goes into how the claim is drafted, whether you get too close to one-on-one -on -one or not. Or one -on -one. We quite a few references to those old cases which I found, which I found kind of delightful and interesting, right? There was that, the incandescent lamp. The I want to go back to the mouse example because the difficulty with the mouse example is that if I say because the claims cover it, anything that binds to all 15 of the target uh, amino acid sequences of the antigen, right? And I say, I want an antibody that has specific 15 things. I may have to have thousands of thousands of mice run before any of them will generate any 
15 things. So it's different from saying, here's the 15 structure I want. Now let me make it. Even if I knew that, I still might have to generate thousands of mice to randomly generate that in that antibody. That seems to me the core difficulty. So that, that I think gets to my earlier point about the progress of where antibody technology is. So it's not thousands of mice. Each mouse has millions of different potential antibody responses within it, within a single mouse. Similarly, phage display, again, has trillions of different antibody molecules. That's where we are today. So in a single panel, you're screening millions of potential hits in these screens. It's, it is, I'm not gonna say it's trivial because I don't wanna trivialize the work that our scientists do, but it is in essence for an antibody scientist as routine as it gets. It may be, but the converse is, is until you run those experiments to hybridize and determine blocking, you have no idea what's going to work. And that's the question. Is it an invention to simply claim anything that works? And I at least argued in my brief that's precisely what the history of functional claiming law prohibited. There was one interesting issue that got discussed very briefly, but not, I thought, properly, which is, why, and maybe um, you know this, Emily, why weren't the claims construed as Section 112F functional claims, which then limit them to things similar to the embodiments that are disclosed, whether it's the 28 or the 380, however many. Um, yeah, the section 112F was never raised um, in either of the district court cases. Um, that's typically not a claiming format that is used in the biological arts um, because the, the term antibody is well understood to be a structure, a structure as opposed to kind of a nonce term like processor. Um, so I, I think that um, I, I know 112 F came up in a number of amicus briefs as a potential um, solution to this problem. Um, but I, I really, at the heart of it, that's just a different way of of drafting claims. Still, the patent would need to be enabled. So I'm not sure. It, it's really, you know, it, it gives us a, uh, an answer to, you know, how, how many, you know, what, what amount of information is required to be Why don't you can just give that. a quick description of section 112F just for our audience members? So 112F came as a congressional response to a case called Halliburton from 1946 or so, which said you can't describe claims by using functional language at the specific point of novelty. The language of the act says that you interpret the scope of a functional claim, um, again, whether it applies to non-combination claims, whatever that means is an open question, but you can't interpret the scope of a functional claim to cover anything that performs a function. You interpret it to only relate to the it disclosed embodiments here are the 26 or possibly the 385 and things that are their equivalent, structural equivalent. So I agree with you, antibodies well known, but the two binding functions that are specifically decided, why weren't those two limitations construed on the same principle of 112F other than that they didn't use the magic word means plus, which seems silly. I'll just it throw is, in here. Oh, is, go ahead. Go ahead. Just please. very, very briefly. I mean, uh, you know, as I said, I'm not uh, the scientific expert, but you know, the other thing I think to keep in mind, right, is that we're talking about a patent with a priority date of 2008, and so we are talking about what was in the technology 15 years ago, um, and not today. And I think, you know, Michael, the the kinds of of advancements that you're describing, then when we have patents that are litigated in the future about, um, you know, what was done in 2023. Um, are probably going to have very different um, evidentiary records about what a person of ordinary skill would have not only would have known, but what would have deemed, uh, you know, routine or undo. So I, you know, I, I think that is um, just something to keep in mind during this whole discussion. No, it's a great point, Mel, but it, again, 
20 years ago, 25 years ago, you could screen millions in a shot to billions in a shot. So that that's where, you know, listening to some of these arguments, it, it got, you just realized it was going off track a bit because the technology was seemingly made to be much more difficult than it really is. And, and that seemed to catch uh, many of the justices' attention. And, and I think it actually did in Juno as well, unfortunately. It's this, this notion of millions and millions is such a hurdle, such a burden. It but gains the, action and it's But it it's goes back to what you've claimed and you've claimed everything that works. And if you don't tell people what works, then that's, that's the problem, right? If you wanna, if, if, you, if you know how to identify and advance everything that works within the genus, then you disclose that and then you're fine. But the problem with the patents in these cases, including in the Juno case, which I did litigate on behalf of Kite, um, is, is that that's, that's not the case. That's not what the record shows. Justice Jackson, I thought, properly asked, isn't there a problem with lack of notice? But of course, the court didn't take the written description question in this case, which is, again, why it may be a particularly bad vehicle to rule here. But even more importantly, going back to your point, if it's really that easy to make these things, then the question goes back to what is it that's actually being invented, right? And you know that, that's, that's the thing that they really didn't get very much guidance about because if it's that easy, and I think they, they were influenced by it's that easy, because they think, well, what's undo here? What's difficult here? It, but it's not that easy until you've been taught the spots to hit. And then even given the tools, again, in the case of Amgen, the two anchor antibodies, which now let you set up a trivial screen. Up until Amgen's patent and all the, all the disclosure, it wasn't easy. And that's why it took a decade to figure this out. Once you have it, and that's the issue with the antibodies, once you have it, once you have that roadmap, once you have where on your target that antibodies need to bind, it's trivial to get them. There's, there's gonna be difficulties, of course, it's science. It's not gonna work every time. There's gonna be unique uh, you know, species, antibodies that you might get out of it. But the overall roadmap was set forth. You could then make those antibodies. And that's really what, it, it, it's the, the heart of the quid pro quo, quite honestly. Because I can tell you going forward, what are patent attorneys strategizing about right now, depending on the outcome of this case? How little to disclose. If I'm only gonna get a single antibody sequence out of US patent law, guess what? I'm not gonna, do, I'm not gonna teach the public anything other than that sequence and that's it. Is that really where we wanna go? Think about where technology is going these days, not just targets for cholesterol, but, you know, I, I'm in the oncology space. I think about tumor neoantigens. Nobody knows what they are. It's not a big protein target. Do you really want a world where the patent system, instead of incentivizing disclosure to promote progress of the useful arts, instead is doing the opposite? And it's telling us, hide what you're going after. Hide these new targets that everybody in the world can learn from and instead only disclose a single antibody. And hey, you know what? In 12 years, you'll get a biosimilar out of it. Does that really help? Is that really where we wanna go? Because that's where it's going to head. So it, it seemed to me that there was at least some tension in that argument that came out in different ways, but not clearly. You've expressed it, I think, much more clearly um, even than Jeff Lampkin did. Um, although Jeff did, I think, a reasonably good job of trying to explain that it's the blocking that's the key here, right? I mean, the, the two targets that block so that you then have something to reference. And that is, if, it's, if it is that easy, then presumably... Uh-oh. Josh, your sound is cut out. Josh. Can't hear you. How about now? Yes. That was good. If it's that easy and people don't disclose the method that makes it that easy, they you know they, 
the question is, is couldn't they also come up with it themselves? And that's the key question here, right? For so, some so, targets, right. you so, might be able to. Right. For so, others, you, you don't know what the targets are. And there's a tremendous yeah. amount of research that goes into these. And, and I'm using some of the modern oncology targets that are just getting published on right now. Right. So this the goes- The problem that you get into in that situation is that you are claiming an, the invention is finding the target. And the target is a naturally occurring <laughs> thing. And so that's where you get into this problem with section 101. And is that a patentable discovery to discover a target which exists in nature? And if Except everybody else is routine and everybody else knows how to do it, once you find the target, what is, what is your invention? So then it gets back to my point. Then will people disclose a new target? If I come up with a new tumor neoantigen, why would I disclose that? Why would I put that out to the public when I can claim the specific antibody that works against it? I, again, would defer to scientists about whether once you have the antibody, if you can go back and figure out what the target is. Um, but I would point out that a lot of that research is done in the university space where there are other incentives to disclose the target and disclose what you've found. There are, but universities also have robust um, patent filings. And, and quite honestly, universities are getting harmed by the state of our 112 law. Nobody's, or I would, I would say licensing from universities has drastically dropped in recent years. And that's because universities like, like us, like InstoBio, a small company, we don't have the resources to generate all of this extra um, exemplification that the federal circuit seems to want these days. Universities do even less than what small biotechs do. And as a result, when, when you're doing a due diligence on university IP that you would have licensed 20 years ago, these days you look at it and you just say, this is a joke. It's not even worth you know, continuing this discussion. We can go on our own and avoid it. We don't want that to happen. So I don't think anyone wants to discourage, and this goes back to the US government's point, to discourage people from disclosing structure function relationships, but they do want to discourage people from, sorry, from not disclosing them, right? They do want to discourage people from claiming things when they haven't figured out the structure function relationship, but have only identified a target and said, you can claim everything that works. This goes back to, again, the whole point of my brief was to say, you can't claim a result. You can only claim an invention and the invention has to disclose sufficient structure function relationship. And what the U.S. government argues is, is if you can get that whole claim and keep anybody from ever going on the market, nobody's going to spend the time to discover the structure function relationship. Yes, you can get a thing, but you may not get lots of things and you may not get the best things. That's really, I think, the core of this case. All right. This is this is a really, really fascinating discussion, but I do want to get to uh, one other audience question that we have. Um, so we have an audience member who's asking about kind of what the implications are beyond just the pharmaceutical and antibody context. Um, and I mentioned that there were a couple of briefs filed by um, some organizations working on technology and working on computer technology and software. Um, I know we don't have any of those folks on this panel, but if any of you wanted to comment on what you saw as the potential implications for those industries outside of the pharmaceutical space, I think that would be that that would just um, be really interesting to add an extra dimension to what's going on in this case. So, Charles, in my view, this ruling has the potential to impact any technology sector that relies on genus patent claims. Um, I don't think it's limited to, to antibody claims at all. And I think the Supreme Court, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, uh, would not want to create an antibody specific role here. Um, so given that enablement is a requirement for you know every every US um, issued patent, um, this ruling um, could very well um, impact um, any, any type of patent claim that claims more than a single example. 
It's also critically important because it's precisely the unpredictable technologies that have most of the social value. And for those, um, you actually need functional claims to get broad coverage because you can't figure out what those, and let me know can, unless you actually generate the no, next Nobel Prize for antibodies. So that's precisely why it's just a very different set of opinions as to whether broad functional claims for initial people who are able to make something within the genus and can enable others to find other things within the genus should get the whole genus or not. Um, we have very different views about that, but that's a fundamental policy question for the entire patent system. Yeah, I know one of the uh, one of the the tech industry. I think it's the HTIA brief um, uh, addressed. Um, you know, similar to Josh, I think the the point that you made, right, where which is about the the role of one twelve F in all of this and um, and the problems with single function plan. Right. Yeah, and the, the problems with, with functional claiming, I, you know, that is a real problem in, in the, the, I don't like calling it the tech industry because all of this is tech, but, you know, the, what's traditionally called the, the, the tech uh, side of, of the house, um, I think it comes up in different ways. You know, I, I personally think a lot of the issues that we treat as 101 abstract idea issues are actually 112 issues and ought to be dealt with that way. And so, you know, I think, I think everyone, um, in this system should be very concerned about what the law and enablement is. All right, um, so I so so we're coming close to the hour. Um, I think that I was told that we would be able to open the um, open the discussion up to the other audience members if they wanted to stay for a sort of virtual reception. I'm not sure if that's possible, um, but I think that our, our our meeting our meeting folks will hopefully be able to to let us know. Uh, but in the last few minutes, um, kind of what's what's the big takeaway for all of you? What do you? I, I guess you know I'm not going to ask you to to predict what the Supreme Court is going to do, but um, kind of where do you where do you see this issue going, and what do you what do you hope kind of comes of this case? Um, I guess going in the order of my screen. Oh, Emily, go ahead. <laughs> I hope we get a clarification on what the the proper enablement test is. Um, I I think we'll we're likely to see the court make a statement that the cumulative time and effort required is not dispositive. And of course, I'd like to see them uh, announce a new standard and um, uh, reverse. I just don't want them to make it worse. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I was very pleased to see how many justices um, brought up the possibility of a dig. Um, I, you know, they, they took this case over the recommendation of the SG not to do so. And um, I think the briefing, the merits briefing, sort of more so than the petition stage breaching, briefing really showed where the actual disagreement is between the two sides. And, and I think the justices uh, caught on to that. Uh, Nina? I guess I, I think it was clear that everybody agrees you need to enable the full scope of the claims. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was that was clear. The, the justices really were pushing to find disagreement actually to what the, mm -hmm. about what the law was. So um, I think it was kind of the takeaway was how much agreement there actually was among sides. On the yeah, we didn't have a lot of discussion of that, but they were spending a lot of time trying to figure out what exactly do you all disagree with, which was which was really interesting. And Josh, I'll give you the last word. Uh, again, I think that they will keep the case to say it's not just the cumulative amount um, so that, that that takes that off the table. But I don't think that they have any clear sense either of what full scope actually means. Does it mean just create something within the genus um, or something within the genus that the faucet would care about? Or does it mean create any particular thing without undue experimentation? And they have no concept of what undueness is. Um, like Michael, I worry 
what they say, but I'm not sure that it's actually that much worse than what Wands is because Wands doesn't tell you undo compared to what. And until we get something that actually gives a theory here, we will have inconsistent decisions. So I'm hopeful that they will get to that. I am doubtful that they will. All right, wonderful. Thank you all for participating. This was a fantastic discussion. I learned a whole lot about different aspects of this case. Um, so if everyone could give a, I guess, virtual round of applause to our, to our distinguished panel guests.